Now, this uh, uh, talk is going to be about intragranular nucleation during transformations in steels. And you can see much more detail uh, on, on this website. So I'm going to avoid detail, but everything will be available if you go to this particular website. Now, uh, what is the issue with intragranular nucleation? Because sometimes when we get ferrite grains forming inside an austenite grain, it's actually advantageous from the point of view of uh, fracture, because you will get grains in many different crystallographic orientations, and therefore the cleavage crack path is deflected frequently through the material. So you get an improvement in toughness, and that's uh, really important because when we make strong materials in general, uh, the toughness will decrease. Now, uh, many years ago, um, Ricks and uh, co-workers uh, did some calculations on the effectiveness of nucleation on an inclusion, which may be a non-metallic inclusion inside the steel, when you compare with austenite grain boundary nucleation. Okay, so on the horizontal axis, we are plotting the inclusion radius. Obviously, you don't want a large inclusion because that in turn will damage fracture toughness. And this is simply plotting the activation energy for nucleation scaled by the activation energy for homogeneous nucleation without any defect. And what they came up with was basically, you know, nucleation on inclusions is much more difficult than on an austenite grain surface. And uh, some more, more modern uh, calculations here. Um, refer to um, uh, the same sort of calculation, but this time taking account of the difference in the interfacial energy between the austenite and the inclusion and the ferrite and the inclusion. And this is the austenite ferrite interfacial energy. And this is the contact angle that the ferrite makes with the inclusion. And what this shows is that when the difference in interfacial energy between austenite and inclusion and ferrite and inclusion is large, it is actually possible to stimulate nucleation on inclusions in preference to austenite grain surfaces. So there are circumstances in which an inclusion can be more effective at nucleating uh, ferrite than an austenite grain boundary. So I'm going to explore what circumstances would allow an inclusion to be more effective than an austenite grain boundary. I'll show you micrographs later on in the talk. Now, the conventional way in which people have handled this problem is to look at the crystallographic misfit between the lattice of the inclusion and that of ferrite. So here, for example, are typical non-metallic inclusions that you might find in steels. Uh, from oxides to sulfides and uh, nitrides. And uh, the assessment begins by assuming an orientation relationship between the inclusion and the ferrite, because you need to do that in order to uh, calculate the lattice misfit, the difference in lattice spacing on particular planes. So this is the second assumption that you have to make, is that the inclusion and the ferrite will be in contact on that particular plane. And then you calculate the misfit on that plane as 3%, for example, and you would say, okay, it's more effective to nucleate on this plane than on this plane because the misfit here is large. And also inclusions which have a very large misfit will tend not to nucleate ferrite. Now, there are some logical difficulties with an analysis like this, because as I pointed out to you, you first have to assume that there is a certain orientation relationship between the ferrite and the uh, inclusion. And you know, many of these inclusions actually form in the liquid. So there is no reason why they should have a particular orientation with the austenite and therefore a particular orientation relationship with the ferrite. 
Uh, and the second thing is that you have to assume that there are certain planes uh, of the inclusion and the uh, ferrite which will be in contact. And that again is not necessarily going to happen. So um, one way of getting around these difficulties is to do experiments, okay? And this is an interesting experiment where we take uh, two bits of steel here, we place our test inclusion here, okay? Which might be a ceramic or a nitrite or potassium nitrate or whatever. And we apply a certain force to make a, a bond at a high temperature uh, by induction heating, for example, in a thermomechanical simulator. And then you look uh, at the interface here. So, so the black region contains the titanium oxide inclusions, and these are the two steel samples. And you see, is there actually a greater tendency to nucleate at the interface between the inclusion and the steel than away from the inclusion? And clearly, in the case of titanium monoxide, that is the case that it stimulates the nucleation of these plates of ferrite. Uh, and here is another example uh, of titanium dioxide, again, uh, stimulating much more nucleation uh, at the interface between the inclusions and the steel than away from the interface. So this gives an absolutely clear idea of whether or not this inclusion is going to be effective in nucleating ferrite. It doesn't tell you about the mechanism by which these inclusions are working. Uh, and you know, the mechanisms can actually be manifold. For example, um, sorry. For example, this is uh, Ti2O3. And the way that Ti2O3 works is that it has an affinity for manganese. So if your steel contains manganese, it actually absorbs that manganese at the junction. So this is a microanalysis plot here, which shows that near the inclusion steel interface, you basically have a depletion of manganese because it is entered into the titanium oxide. So this particular uh, inclusion works by absorbing an austenite stabilizing element from its surroundings, and therefore it stimulates a nucleation. Uh, now here we have uh, titanium um, nitride, and it's not terribly effective, as you can see, in nucleating uh, ferrite. And you have to do these uh, uh, experiments on a wide range so that you can demonstrate that it's not just the presence of a surface here, which is doing the nucleation. Some inclusions do not stimulate the nucleation of ferrite and others are less effective and some of them don't do anything at all. So there's a huge list of uh, materials that we have examined as to the potency for stimulating ferrite nucleation. And then of course you have to work out a way of putting them inside the steel. I'll come back to that later. So here uh, is a set of inclusions which I call chemically active. That means they actually either absorb or partition elements into the steel which favor the formation of ferrite. And these are chemically inactive and are less effective, but nevertheless, if there is a small tendency to nucleate ferrite. And these are ineffective at nucleating ferrite. They do nothing whatsoever to enhance the nucleation of ferrite, which is not in contact with an austenite grain boundary. Okay, so let's let's see what the microstructure should look like. Uh, so here is a, an example. Okay, so these are austenite grain boundaries, which are covered by layers of allotriomorphic ferrite, and these are plates of ferrite that have nucleated intragranularly within the austenite grains on some sort of a heterogeneity, like an inclusion, and this is really quite important in the sense that if 
a crack is propagating across this material, then it will encounter many different crystallographic orientations of ferrite. Okay? So effectively, you are making the material tougher, even though it may be stronger. Now, there isn't a single phase here. We have two different kinds of ferrite, and they, be, they have different kinetics and thermodynamics. So you should imagine this as if there are two different phases forming in the austenite, and they are competing with each other. And whichever phase wins will have the greater volume fraction inside the steel. So how do we tackle the formation of several phases at the same time? Well, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction. So supposing that we had to calculate a time temperature transformation diagram, then these are the factors that we need to take account of. We need nucleation theory. So we've got these particles forming independently. We need growth theory. So whatever phase you're interested in, you need some uh, description of the mechanism and therefore to be able to calculate the growth rate. You need to take account of the fact that particles which are nucleated from different locations will hit each other. And therefore you have physical impingement and it's not possible for this particle obviously to grow into this particle once that happens. And there is the phenomenon known as soft impingement where you, know, you have two particles growing from different locations and eventually their diffusion fields will overlap and therefore the growth rates will diminish. Now, how do we handle all this? Well, a uh, long time ago, uh, Avrami provided the answer uh, to take account of hard impingement. That means particles which come into contact with each other. So this is uh, glass devitrifying and you can see that obviously at some point they will come into contact and therefore no longer grow. So Avrami assumed that, look, uh, let's, let's first of all uh, believe that a particle can grow into another particle. If, if it encounters one particle, it will simply keep on growing, okay? And obviously these regions of overlap are not physical. So we then do something to account for the fact that we are over calculating the volume fraction of transformation. So here we have two particles which have formed at a time t and at a short time interval later, they will have grown bigger. But during that time interval delta t, you also will have new particles which have nucleated, for example, this one and this one which is growing inside an existing particle. So that obviously is wrong. So Avrami came up with the simple idea that look, uh, the true change in volume fraction will be related to this incorrect change in volume fraction when I add all of these dark blue regions, okay? So this is what he called the extended change in volume fraction where you assume that particles can grow each through each other. And if I take this and I simply multiply it by the probability of finding untransformed material, so this is simply the volume fraction of untransformed material, then that gives me the real change in volume fraction. Beautifully simple idea, uh, which allows you to at first calculate the wrong volume fraction and then to correct it by multiplying by the probability of untransformed material to get the real change in volume fraction. And this particular uh, equation is very easy to integrate and therefore you have the true volume fraction related to the extended volume fraction, which takes account also of particles growing through each other. Okay, so this very simple uh, equation gets rid of the problem of hard impingement. Now, supposing we are observing transformation happening, then different particles will start at different time intervals. So when time is equal to tau one, this particular particle nucleated, and then it continues to grow and, and so on. These are other particles forming. So what we will see is a distribution of uh, particle sizes, but the volume of a particle which forms at a particular time period, uh, let's assume that we have spheres and they're growing at a constant rate. The volume of a particle that forms at a particular, in, after a particular incubation time tau will be simply 
given by t minus tau cubed because it doesn't exist before the time equals tau and multiplied by pi. So this is basically pi r cubed, okay? Four upon three pi r cubed. So that's the volume of a single particle which formed at a time period tau. If I then multiply it by the nucleation rate per unit volume and the total volume of my sample, then I have the change in extended volume. Okay? And then I do the Avrami correction. I multiply the, by the probability of finding untransformed material to get the change in the actual volume fraction. And you know we go through integration and arrive at a final equation, which tells me the volume fraction of ferrite is equal to one minus this exponential, where we have the nucleation rate per unit volume, we have the growth velocity here. So we've got everything in this equation, which deals with diffusion, with number densities of nucleation sites, with uh, the growth rate according to the particular transformation mechanism and so on. And therefore you can go ahead and calculate time temperature transformation diagrams. So going back to this uh, problem here, uh, what I really want to address is not one phase forming, which is, which, is, uh, which is explained by this equation. There's a single phase forming from a grain of austenite. I want actually two phases forming simultaneously. So how do we handle this in the Avrami format? Well, we came up with a very simple modification that here we have uh, two particles of a phase alpha and a time interval later, they have grown and there might be more nuclei as well. But I also have another phase nucleating. Now, all we have to do is write two equations instead of one. And this again is the probability of finding untransformed material. So instead of just one equation, we now have two equations. And in general, uh, these have to be solved I would say almost always they have to be solved numerically because they are in the beta and the alpha are interacting with each other. So at every stage of the calculation, you need to modify the composition of the austenite to take account of the fact that the beta and alpha are not the same in chemical composition as the austenite. So we've tackled at the same time the hard impingement problem and the soft impingement problem uh, where diffusion fields overlap. Of course, we are using an approximation that any solute that is partitioned or absorbed is uniformly distributed in the austenite. So that's called a mean field approximation. Cut a long story short, uh, here are some calculations which show ferrite which forms at the austenite grain boundaries, ferrite which forms intragranularly and the total volume fraction using that simultaneous transformation kinetics model. And this is a large austenite grain size. When we have a small austenite grain size, you can see that these curves switch around, that I get very little of um, intragranular ferrite and a lot more of the grain boundary ferrite. And the reason is, of course, supposing these are our austenite grain sizes, the thickness of the layer of ferrite that forms at the austenite grain surface is the same here and here. Same for the large and the small austenite grain sizes. So if the thickness is identical, then at a smaller austenite grain size, you will get a larger volume fraction of grain boundary ferrite, the allotromorphic ferrite. And therefore you will get a greater enrichment of carbon in the middle, and therefore you kill off the intragranular nucleation. And we can do calculations like this uh, quite routinely. So here, for example, uh, we are looking at 100 micrometer austenite grain size. Uh, this time we are looking at uh, ferrite, Wiedmannstein ferrite and perlite forming simultaneously, all right? Uh, they form at different rates, but we, when we start the calculation at the high temperature, they are all allowed to form, okay? And uh, here you get ferrite forming first, then Wiedmannstein ferrite, uh, they are forming simultaneously. And finally, perlite when the composition of the austenite has the appropriate value. And this is at a, a slow cooling rate. If you increase the cooling rate, then the Wiedmannstein ferrite 
increases dramatically at the expense of the allotromorphic variety. And now if I reduce the grain size to 30 micrometers, you know, we completely lose weedman statin ferrite because there isn't enough austenite left to stimulate the weedman statin ferrite. It just decomposes into perlite. We lose all the weedman statin ferrite at a higher cooling rate because we slow down the growth of the allotromorphic ferrite. We do get some weedman statin ferrite. So these calculations can be done for uh, rot materials, uh, but I want to move on to welding. Uh, and some of the terminology I'll use is the same as what Dr. Shom used in his lecture. Uh, here is the complexity of welding. Uh, it has absolutely all physics, right? Starting from plasma all the way to solid state transformations. And of course, uh, you know, you don't just influence the region which melts, but you also have a heat affected zone where, as Dr. Shom explained, you know, whatever complex processing you've done to the steel, you will get a change in the structure in the heat affected zone. So you should really regard a weld as a defect, okay? You, you spend huge quantities of money to produce a beautiful microstructure with complicated thermomechanical processing. If things go wrong in the heat affected zone, you're in trouble, okay? And that is the reason why uh, weld metals always have a low carbon concentration. Uh, and of course, welding is always continuous cooling. It's never isothermal. I don't know of any example of isothermal welding. And there will be a variety of transformation products. Now, there is a consequence to low carbon concentration and structural steels these days uh, contain low carbon concentrations because it makes them more valuable. For most structural steels, you don't need strength because there are many parameters other than strength that you have to exploit. So for example, if I make a very tall building with a very strong steel, then the building will flex in the wind because it doesn't have structural rigidity. So you can't really use steel, which is stronger than about 400 megapascals to make high rise buildings or bridges. Uh, so you can afford to have a very low carbon concentration. Now there is a consequence to having a low carbon concentration, and that is that the kinetics of transformation become very sensitive to carbon. So many structural steels now have a carbon concentration, which is about 0.03 weight percent. And you can see that if I, if I change the concentration by equal amounts here, 0.02, the kinetics increase dramatically when I get to these very low carbon concentrations. The reason is, of course, you know that um, the solubility of carbon in ferrite is approximately 0.02 weight percent. So when you get to these values, uh, you're partitioning very little carbon and therefore diffusion control growth becomes very rapid. And the same applies, uh, so this is for allotriomorphic ferrite, the grain boundary ferrite. Uh, same calculations here for Weedmus satin ferrite. You know, as soon as we get close to the um, solubility limit of carbon in ferrite, the growth rate shoots off. Okay, here you can see it's a remarkable 600 micrometers per second. Now, there are consequences of this, uh, both the fact that the well metal has a low carbon concentration and the steel has a low carbon concentration. Uh, one consequence is that you get this competition between grain boundary and uh, weedman sand ferrite and the so-called acicular ferrite, which is basically intragranularly nucleated ferrite. These dark dots here are inclusions, uh, non-metallic inclusions, because welding is a dirty process compared with uh, road steel. Road steel might contain something like 30 to 50 parts per million of oxygen, a weld typically will contain about 300 parts per million of oxygen, oxides in other words. So if you can do something to increase the chance of intragranular nucleation, then you have a better weld metal. 
And one way is to manipulate the growth rate of weed mist and ferrite, to retard the growth rate of weed mist and ferrite. And then these plates have a chance to form inside the austenite grain. And just to show you, uh, this is the acicular ferrite that Dr. Shom referred to, uh, forming on uh, an inclusion. So you won't see inclusions in all of these plates because you're doing sections, two-dimensional sections. So the chance of finding an inclusion is basically roughly equal to the volume fraction of inclusions, which is quite small. But without these inclusions, you would not get uh, the acicular ferrite. And this is very good for toughness of well metal. You don't have any chance to do a heat treatment after you've made the well deposit in most cases. And we can do these calculations on what to do in order to uh, optimize the amount of allotromorphic ferrite and the rest of the microstructure. Uh, and remember that this is the phase that we want to improve toughness and strength at the same time. And what I'm going to show you now is a calculation, all right? So I'm actually going to do a calculation of a well microstructure model. And the computer program that I'm going to show you uh, is available freely. Uh, if you go to the website that I had on my um, first slide. Okay, so this is a pro computer program that we developed and which is widely used to design welding consumables and uh, by universities as well. And I'll, I'll go fairly slowly through this. So there are many options, you know, you can control, for example, the boron level, the nitrogen level, in order to do a calculation, the geometry of the tensile test, the arc transfer efficiency, and so forth. So I'm going to just take the easy option right now. And we cover all of these processes. So manual metal arc, cord wire, tandem submerged arc, submerged arc, vertical up, manual, you know, you can weld in different positions. It can be vertical up or horizontal uh, and so on. Flux cord arc, well metal, and we have uh, a limited capabilities for laser welding as well, uh, simply because the level of validation is, depends really on how popular the process is and how often people do experiments in that process. And laser welding, generally speaking, is used for thin materials. Okay, so I'm going to pick manual metal arc welding. And I don't know what austenite grain size I will get, so we will calculate it. Now, remember, all the details are available on my website, so I'm not going to go through that. Uh, you know, the scientific science is all available. Then we put in the chemical composition, so I'll choose 0.1 weight percent of carbon, typically 0.5 weight percent of manganese, uh, sorry, silicon, and one weight percent of uh, manganese, and uh, I'll skip all the others. So. The computer program contains the thermodynamics to deal with all of these elements and some aspects of the kinetics as well. Now, the welding current we'll use is 200 amps and a voltage of 30. These are typical values for manual metal arc welding and 0.004 meters per second. And in the past temperature, I'm not going to use one, so I'll just set that as 25 degrees centigrade I'll put in 30 parts per million of nitrogen and no boron, um, typically 300 parts per million of uh, oxygen. Uh, you know, you can put in all these values and see what happens, but I'm going to use the, the set of inputs that you see right now, okay? So I'll continue with the calculation. And uh, uh, this is just a summary of the inputs. You know, uh, here we have the heat input the arc transfer efficiency that you get. In other words, arc transfer efficiency is simply the amount of energy you put in electrically to how much you gain in actually making the fusion zone, okay? And here is a calculation of the microstructure. So we have here 23% of allotromorphic ferrite, 10% of weed mistand ferrite, and 51% of uh, acicular ferrite, and some martensite as well, some retained austenite, and this is a calculated austenite grain structure. If you're doing a multi-pass weld, then you would have 
about 26% of unaffected by heat of the subsequent pass uh, microstructure, the primary, and then that is the quantity of your total well, which is influenced by heat as you deposit subsequent passes, the thickness of the ferrite layer, and so on. Uh, these are calculations of the mechanical properties. So here you have uh, the ultimate tensile strength of the primary microstructure, secondary microstructure, and the overall properties. Uh, the tensile strength, the yield strength and tensile strength of the whole weld metal, um, and some idea of how much scatter you should expect in toughness, and the contributions of the individual bits and pieces to the total strength that we observe. So, um, the calculations that I illustrated to you um, capture all of the complexity of many transformations happening at the same time and of all of the typical alloying elements, continuous cooling transformation, and different kinds of welding processes. And as I said to you, the source code for this program is available freely. You simply have to compile it to run on your particular system. So you're welcome to use it. A huge amount of effort has gone into developing the program and uh, the validation of the program against both published data and when it's used in industry. Okay, now I'm going to finish this talk and allow lots of times for questions. 